Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by Jags. Where's that die cast? Right there. The leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jags.com to make your car or truck or Jeep more awesome. Man, I've been I've been excited about this one. Uh, the GOAT. I mean, that explains it all. Ricky Carmichael. Ricky, welcome to Kenny Conversation. I appreciate it. Uh, love your work. Love uh, coffee with Kenny in the mornings. And uh, man, I'm just, I'm glad to be on, brother. Glad to be on. Had a little, uh, I, you know what, when I sent you my email, I, did you write, did you send it to your, the wrong one to your producer? I'm wondering, I, you said it was in there, but. I, I did something wrong, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, you know, when I moved from St. Louis down to North Carolina, I met a lot of country people. Yeah. And they had a lot of phrases and they said, Wallace, you done did two things wrong. I said, well, what's that? They said, you thought and you thought wrong. So, I <laughs> <laughs> oh. so well, well, Ricky, listen, we we started talking a lot yeah. before we even got started. That's right. First of all, compliments to you. I, I said to you. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at you right now, you're a look of health. Your face yeah. is chiseled out. So let's start like this, my friend. Uh, yeah. I see you out on the road still on your Triumph. That's but, right. Uh, how are you looking so good? You still still in shape? Yeah. You know, um, I after I quit racing, uh, man, I, I blew up like a damn tick. Yeah. <laughs> And, and honestly, it, you know, I, I just, it, it's all diet for me. Uh, I work out a lot. I ride road bikes a lot. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm fairly active, but all dude, what I see the most results from, um, is, is straight up dieting and consumption. It's not, not as much as what I'm eating. It's how much I'm eating. And it's always been that way. You and I were talking before we, uh, started uh, started the podcast the conversation and uh it's been it was that way when i was burning all those calories when i was racing motocross i mean i still had to be on the nail with my diet or i would see i would see a, a little gain on the scale and i and i i've never really said this to anyone and i but i truly believe this when you have a slow metabolism and you have to be accountable for what your your intake is or or lack thereof I think that instills discipline in other forms of, of the sport. I really do. Cause if you got to be on the nail with the diet, then, you know, it treats you to be strict on other things and whether it's practicing or what have you. So, yep, that's uh that's it, man. Just a, a lack of eating and eating the right stuff as well. Man, I tell you what, you said that so eloquent. Uh, I'll add to that. Uh, I have one nerve and you just stepped on it <laughs> because I am the same as you. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here around 165, 167, but buddy, I can get to 189, 190 oh, yeah. in a heartbeat. And uh, like you said, the discipline that, I mean, I, I fight with my myself yeah. and I got places around my hometown of Arnold, Missouri. Yeah. Where do I go eat, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To yeah. make sure I eat good. Um, I know. I'm telling you, it's, uh, you know, not to sit here and, and, cry about this and oh what a bummer we got a slow metabolism things could be a lot worse but i tell you i mean you look great too you've lost a lot of weight and I, i'm exactly like you it just i i really have to 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 be be on it with my diet and unfortunately man i love uh, anything bad for you as far as eating Me i too. love it i love freaking <laughs> it's crazy i love sweets I love fried food. I love chips. Anything bad, I love it. And and if there's one thing that I struggle, working out, whatever, I am down for it. But the hardest thing for me, and always has been, is my freaking diet, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm with you. Listen, Kenny conversation goes everywhere. And uh, yes. just a quick preview, you know, um, we're going to start off with your motorcycling. But mm -hmm. I want to remind everybody. Later in our conversation, we're going to talk about you coming to NASCAR and everything you did. So, you know, I, I do this and it, it's kind of rhythmatic. I do it with everybody. And the reason I do it is not just to remind you, but to remind uh, the young kids nowadays. You know, Brother Rusty says, Herman, there's a generation gap. And you got to remind people because people remember 
what they want to. So let let's do it like this. I mean, this is the this is the way I started out with Tony Stewart, Kevin Harvick, everybody. Yep. So you're gonna have to give me about a minute because you were that damn good. <laughs> Fifteen time AMA championship, yep. of course, uh, ten outside. You know, motocross five. Yep. Supercross indoors. Now, Ricky, you stop me when any of this is wrong. No, that's you're exactly right. Okay, total 100, 150 wins. That's right. 102 in motocross, 48 in supercross. Yep. Now, this next one is just paralyzing. Just I, I, it made me stop. Two perfect seasons in 125. 250s, actually. Yeah, we're at 450. Yeah, the premier class. Yeah. Oh, you, 2002. And then 2004. You were never beaten. You were never beaten no. in two years. No. That, that's insane. Uh, Five-time winner of AMA's Rider of the Year. Yep. I mean, Ricky, that's insane. Uh, <laughs> and there's way more. We can go to the, you know, the X Games and, and right. things of that nature. But I think that paints the picture. So when I read all that to you, where does that take your brain? What What do you think? I, you know, Kenny, it, it happens so fast, you know, uh, but the first thing that I think is I'm thankful for the opportunity that I got. And I still look back and it, it, it doesn't seem real. And, and honestly, things were going by so quick. Like I, like I just said that uh, I didn't have really, a, really time to grasp it. And it really didn't set in until later on uh, many, many years after I had retired from racing. Uh, but I'm just thankful for it. You know, um, I don't, I don't like a lot of attention. Uh, I'm proud of what I've uh, accomplished, but I never set out to do that. I just, uh, you know what, I was raised to go out there and do it a hundred percent or don't do it at all. And, uh, always do your best. Try not to make the same mistakes twice. And this is just where we ended up. Um, but I got to give it to the, the people that I had around me. Uh, that set me on the right path. Obviously, I had wonderful, supportive parents that sacrificed everything like a lot of good parents do. And then, of course, my sponsors and mentors along the way. And like I said, I mean, there were no magic answers. There were no magic answers. It was just straight up hard work and outworking the competition. If my competition were doing 100 laps during the week of, of practice and repetitions, um, you know, I'm going to do 150. That is straight up what it was. Uh, it wasn't always easy. Um, as you know, winning is never easy um, and doing your best is never easy, but uh, just it's simple, just out trying to outwork and, and, and learning from the mistakes mm -hmm. that you make. But uh, it was a hell of a ride. You know, th this is such a deep uh, conversation for a lot of uh, competitors, you know, uh, Father John, when Kim and myself got married, he, he looked at me and he said, what are you going to do, Kenny, when you grow up? I said, I'm going to be a race car driver. Yeah. And, and of course, he said, be careful. Competition will kill you. So, you know, Ricky, you're way up here. Mm -hmm. and there's just no doubt about it. And then Thanks. when you look at other competitors, they're always they're always trying to figure out why they're not like you. You know, uh, same with me and Jeff Gordon. Jeff Gordon was just damn good. I mean, really gifted by God. So do you believe, and I did ask this question to some of the other greats, do you believe that you have a little bit of God-gifted talent? I, I, I don't. There are people on a motorcycle that have way more God-given talent than I do as far as riding right. ability where I feel like I was given a gift is I was able at a very, very young age to learn the sacrifices that my parents were making for, for me to, to make it to someday being the best ever or, or, or make a living at riding motorcycles. I was able to recognize that at a very young age. I would say probably nine to 11 years old was when I recognized like, man, I can see what my parents are doing. And honestly, I hated racing. I just didn't want to let them down straight up. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, listen, I loved racing, you know, like I, 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 at the end of the day, I loved it, but there were times going to practice during the week. I was like praying for rain or, mm -hmm. you know, so I wouldn't have to practice that day or, or, you know, hoping God, you know, I hate this for my father, but I'm like, man, I wish this bike would go wrong with it today. So <laughs> I, 
I hate that for my dad, but I'm I think like, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, it was so redundant. You know, and you, you, you know, you go back 11 years old, 12 years old. I mean, it got better. Those days kind of went away when you got 16, 17. You can learn to kind of hone in on your skills. But you see your other friends out there having a good time playing with their buddies. And I had to go out to this track and just sweat my tail off. And uh, it was miserable. And, of course, my equipment always sucked. It was ragged, wore out, vibrating, all that crap. Uh, but nevertheless, going back to your original question, I think I had a God-given talent to recognize what my parents were doing for me and then their mental ability to, to kind of be, to, to help me get to where I ended up, Kenny. Uh, not so much on the motorcycle because there were guys that could do things a lot better on motorcycles than me, but I had the mental fortitude. And I think that's something that I was born with. I truly believe, and, and, and Kenny, you know this, and you have probably seen this, there are some things you cannot teach. Yeah. There are some things you cannot. I, one, of, one of my great mentors, Johnny O'Mara, um, he was a Supercross champion in his own right. And, and he's worked with the best in the business. And he, he, used, and he used to tell the people the same thing that he told me. But it seemed like those people never would learn from what he said. And I would ask him, I'm like, dude, did you not tell them like, hey, be mindful of this? He's like, dude, I, used, I told him the same things I used to tell you. And I just think it's it's stuff that you're born with. So that's what I think that I was born with, the, the mental side of things. Ricky Johnson uh, was kind of my teammate when he came to NASCAR and ran some truck races. Oh, I didn't realize that. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I got to know him. What a what a clean, oh, yeah. God, godly man. And um, I mm -hmm. will never forget talking to him about his heydays and how great he was. And he, he would say that, he would find the guy that was the best and he would try to get on the track and practice behind him without that, that great racer. No one try to time, time, you know, the, yeah, you know, right. time the, the, the course, in other words, you know, how many, whoops, can you clear, you know, um, sometimes, not sometimes, but when he said that to me and I'm just going to ask you and you, you'll clear it out of my head. Is is motor motocross supercross is is it about being aggressive or is it about being technical? Because he would say he would just try to be technical and follow the best early in his career. Mm -hmm. um, there are there's a certain aspect where it's uh, tech. If you can be technical and aggressive, you got the best of both the worlds. For me, I couldn't get I couldn't get to that technical level like some of my great competitors that I raced against. I, like they relied more on their 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 um, technical side of their ability, where I relied on freaking just hanging it out, dude. All to like, the wall. Yep, I wasn't worried. <laughs> I wasn't worried about being perfect. Yeah, I wanted to try to be perfect, and I and and I, there was some precision there. If, if let's just say I was at an eight point five, and the guys I was trying to beat was at a ten. But my aggression would take me to a 10.5 and essentially and my hard work uh, would essentially put me over over the top. And that's how I would get the results and get the wins that I would. Because, as you know, at, at a high level, you can only rely on your ability for so long. And then at some point, the guy that works the hardest is going to, you know, he's going to sur surpass you because of his hard work and dedication. So. I, uh, I wish I had the precision. I did work on it. But at the end of the day, in my back pocket, I knew I had the aggression and I was willing to hang it out. You know, I was willing to hang it out. You know, you see Kyle Larson, guys like that. They ain't scared to get a little sideways. We go back to Vegas. You and I were talking about that race, but uh, I think it was that race. But yeah. uh, anyhow, you got to be willing to get out of that comfort zone. You got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that was that suited my style. You know, um, uh you are worldly and you did, you did text me and said, what about Ryan Blaney? Yeah. Uh, you know, they said he was illegal after the race. Now a full day, almost two days later, they gave it back to him. You are, uh, when I say you're worldly, you wanted to know, you said, Kenny, Yeah. they, they roughed him up about the length of his shock. Did, was that an advantage? And your, and your question kind of made me have a peek inside your brain because you really, you were thinking competition, you know, did that really uh, make him better? Uh, right. I like the way you think, are you, are, you know, now that you're not really racing competitively, 
Are, you're still thinking like oh, that. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. You know what? Do you ever get like the older you got? Did you did you ever feel like you found more of a passion and setting your race car up and you could win just basically how you set your race car up? I, I mean, and race car is different than two wheels. I shouldn't even. Yeah, that's but it's really not a fair question to it's you. It's still but, competition. We yeah. all still do our idiosyncrasies. Right, right. So that's where the older that I got that I could win kind of on a technicality or, or I could win just knowing like, okay, well, the track's going to get like this. So I'm going to change my ride height to rely more on front end grip or rear end grip, or, you know, I'm, I want the bike to mechanically turn for me a lot like car race. And, you know, you want as much mechanical grip and that thing to turn on its own. So you don't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And that's what I really enjoy uh the late in the later stages of my career and could win a lot of races just on being aware of what the track and forecasting what the track is going to be like um and that's that's kind of the difference so yes when i was asking you about blaney i was i was just curious you know because when they were talking about what the you know it being a little bit lower okay well like how much are we looking like what is that advantage is it like a quarter i think i asked you was it a quarter a second average a lap yeah. You know, or is it, a, you know, a, a tenth of a second? What, like, is it a substantial game? But it doesn't matter now. It's a moot point because they, uh, they, uh, they retracted the uh, penalty. But, but I still think uh, I want your fans and people that admire you to know that about you. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the conversation, I listen. I listen extremely hard. You know, obviously I've done three pages of notes on you, but. You did awesome. Well, I mean, I do my, I'm a big fan of yours, you know, I mean, ditto, any, man. anytime anybody does something like you did, you know, it's like a dog, you know, all of a sudden you wake up, your ears go up, you're like, Jesus, this guy went unbeatable, you know, and you, you know, it, you know, it's hard. So motocross, uh, you're forced to race at an extremely early, early age. Yeah. Um, as, as to where in auto racing, I'm 60 and, um, I'm retired. I retired at 58. Mm -hmm. uh, quit NASCAR at like 53. Mm -hmm. but, but with you, uh, you are in a sport comparable to, uh, well, I don't know if there's a sport like yours. You guys yeah, I, really I mean, early. definitely not, definitely not on the auto side of things. And that was the tough thing. We'll get into it in a little bit, but, but before we, we close the door on, on motocross and supercross racing, I think what people don't understand a, a lot of people, as you know, are great fans and people that follow both disciplines, uh, you know, on the four wheel side and the two wheel side, especially motocross dirt bike racing, you know, you start riding at a very, very young age and you have the ability and the resources to go ride during the week. Can't really do that on the four wheel side. So and and you don't have a roll cage around you. And one thing that never changes is gravity. And so the risk that you're taking during the week and you're always looking for that freaking tenth of a second. And and it ain't if it's when you're going to bust that ass on on two wheels, 100 and 120 percent. It's just you keep going. Bust and that Mark Martin would say it all the time. You know, you just, you, it, it's going to happen. So the burnout uh, factor is, is big. It's a little less now. Um, just the world we live in, the generation we live in, you know, those guys are happy. They're making great money. They're happy with running up front rather than, I mean, they all want to win, but they're happy with a third, you know, like, ah, oh, it's a pretty good night. We're back in my day. Like, damn it. If we didn't win, we were pissed. Yeah. And we're going to go work our tail off the next week and, and try to get that, try to get that win. So, um, yeah, the, the burnout factor um, is a lot more because you're riding hell three, three times a week. You race on Saturday, fly mm -hmm. home Sunday. Uh, I would ride Monday, Tuesday, take Wednesday off, ride Thursday, fly oh Friday, race Saturday. Oh my! You know, and you're doing race simulation and, you know, or if you, you need, you would do, you would practice some corners kind of like football and baseball. You're able to hone in on certain aspects of the, of the craft. You know, I'd work on corner entry, corner exit. I'd work, work on momentum through the corners. I'd work on rhythm lanes, like trying to stay lower, drive through the face of the jumps and just get better. Then, like I said, I do race simulation to get my, you know, keep my base, my cardiovascular base good. And, and, and on top of things, um, so yeah, the burnout factor is a lot more and 
you, you, you know, obviously you just can't, you can physically can't race at a high level uh, on motorcycles like you can on four wheels, unfortunately. And what do you, what do you think? Now we've seen this in NASCAR and this is the reason I asked the question, you know, Harry Gant, my brother, Rusty, that, you yeah. know, 50, 51. Now we're seeing Jeff Gordon and everybody they're done at 42 because, yeah. You know, with all the technology, you know, kids were getting into racing. They started so much earlier. So in, in motocross, what do you think the age is right now where they're going, I've had enough? It's, it's a little bit older uh, just oh, because, really? yeah, just because the grind, like they're riding less during the week. So you're going to get a little more longevity because of that. Yeah. I feel like the, the intensity is there. It just may be the mindset. Like they... Like I said, they all want to win, but they're happy with the podium, you know, and it wasn't like that back in our day. The bikes are a lot better, but, you know, the stakes are higher because they're going faster um, and, and they hit the deck. When they hit the deck, it's a lot harder because of the speeds are so much faster. But I think because of just the intensity and, and not the lack of grind, but uh, the, the longevity is just a little bit more because of. Yeah, maybe the, maybe the mental side of things of them just being happy and not being so hard nosed uh, like back in the day, I guess. So the I longevity know. is a little more. So to the age, Kenny would probably be they probably bowed around thirty three. Where in my day, like twenty seven was, I mean thirty was just like you, you're on the you're on the back end. Now guys are going like they're having good years at thirty one, thirty three. Um, I I feel like it's my opinion, and I'm talking to the greatest right here. Uh, you know, I, I think in in baseball, you know, Jimmy Edmonds, one of our great outfielders. Yep. I know Emmy. I know Edmonds. Okay, Jimmy went to 38, and I mean he was running his ass off in the outfield. Yeah. Uh, so, in my opinion, you guys are probably one of the only sports. I mean, in, in, you know, motors and tires. Yeah. I'm not talking about being gymnasts. Yeah. But you guys quit. You probably quit the earliest of anybody because yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That us and I feel like MotoGP. You know, that's a pinnacle of all two wheel road racing, um, world racing. Uh, yeah, it just, it just, you know, it's a, it's a younger person sport, and you just yeah. physically can't, physically can't do it. But to your point, you start so young, and it's, it's so much easier to go ride. Injuries are a lot more as well. And, um, yeah, it's a bummer. That's the negative part. So, I mean, lucratively, it's so important to go out and, and make as much money as you can if you never want to work again when you're when you retire from racing, which is which is hard to do if you're not winning multiple multiple championships, because uh, that's where, you know, you win in those championships. That's where those championship bonuses rack up and you can put a lot away, you know. So, uh you brought it up, so I'm going to strike the iron while it's hot. Yeah. yeah. Brother brother Rusty always taught me, uh, or, or the great Dick Trickle or Dale Earnhardt Sr., I listened. Although I'm hyperactive, a little little rough around the edges, I, I do hear. Rusty always had this saying. He goes, Herman, that's my nickname. He says, get your head in the carburetor. He, you know, and what he meant was pay attention to your equipment. So with that being said, you are the greatest of all time. There's just no doubt. It's it's not even a nickname. You are. Uh, I, I don't know, man. I say that the, uh, the winning is still claim, but there's so many great guys. I mean, <laughs> like McGrath. Hey, it's my it's my it's my show. <laughs> sorry, dude. Sorry, you're, sorry. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Hey, that would remind me. Rusty would say, uh, "Rusty be telling a story. We'd be drinking beer, and yeah. I, and he's damn lying." And here I am seven years younger than him. And I said, that ain't the way the story went, Rusty. And her, <laughs> or Rusty would put his hand in front of my face. He'd say, shut up, Herman. It's my story. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, um, I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah, I mean, you, you really are. Uh, same, same. Uh, I mean, I guess it's all kind of the same year. Uh, when, I, when I look at motocross and I look at, uh, you won 10 championships, motocross, mm -hmm. five supercross mm -hmm. to this, to this day right now. Um, I mean, I love turning that TV on and watching you guys run indoors on supercross in, in your mind. Uh, what do you think 
is the one that got motocross, supercross where it's at, indoors or outdoors? I think indoors did, you know. Uh, I it's think, gnarly. Yeah, yeah, it's gnarly. Um, it's, it, 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 it's easier to comprehend. It's in a big stadium. It's like a show. Yeah. Um, you know, our promoters did a fantastic job. Like I always thought this for, I always thought this for, um, for four wheels when I kind of dipped into the, to the NASCAR side of things, man, if you had a hell of a promoter that could rent a stadium and, and have a really good format, uh, I don't know why you wouldn't pack the damn house. You know, I mean, that's what we're doing at Supercross. Uh, you know, you make it entertaining, for when there aren't cars on the track, but yeah, I think Supercross is what progressed it, uh, progressed it, and made it more pop, made dirt bikes, dirt biking more popular. I think the X Games certainly helped, mm. brought some notoriety because I'd see people, and to give you why, why I feel like that is true, because I would, well, this is when I was still racing actively. And, and motocross and supercross i'd be at the gym and someone say hey i think i saw you on tv you do that x game stuff I'm like oh no, my no i don't do that you know i i i'm i i do the racing side of stuff but it just you know it it, it brought people to like man i've seen that i've seen that on on tv before and then they and, and then they become fans of all motorsports and and two-wheel racing if that makes sense no it makes sense that i'm sitting here I'm always looking at my notes and my notes say, you know, some summer X games, uh, three mm -hmm. gold, yep. two bronze. Are you saying uh, that made you a little more popular than just normal motocross, supercross? Well, I never, I never made, I mean, you think, you know, the thing was, I mean, when you were younger, like, man, if I could ever be on sports center, man, that would be awesome. And yeah, I never the, made sports center for yeah. all of my accolades and racing. By God, I went into the X Games and jumped over a stupid pole for the step up, <laughs> and I made freaking X uh, Sports Center. I'm like, dude, uh, this is way easier, right? And I've done all these things, accomplished all these wins and championships and all that. I couldn't even get a nugget on Sports Center. I go j jump over a stupid pole, and here I am. It, it, isn't that the way life is? Because Daryl Waltrip, uh, you know, Champion yep. over and over. Daryl said to me, you know, he would talk in depth to me because he was kind of a tutor to me. He goes, Herman, he said, I've done it all in NASCAR. And he says, nobody knows me. He says, but I go on damn a car's cartoon. Yeah. And, and, and he's more, Daryl Walter, more known in, in this generation as the, the movie. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes we, Ricky, some, uh, tell me your thoughts on this. Do sometimes in life we get things when we least expect it that are better than what we work for? Sometimes I think when you're not looking for things, you find it. You know, it's like when you're going through life and, you know, you're trying to find a significant other, you know, it's like they, people always say, and it's something to be said for it. It's like, you know, don't, you'll find it when you're least looking for it. And you just, we've, we've just rattled off two things. Me being on Sports Center and DW being more popular because he's on a stinking cartoon. Yeah, <laughs> that pissed him. Hey, that pissed him off too. By the way, <laughs> did it really? Oh, yeah, I hear you, man. <laughs> well, look, look at us. We're already thirty minutes into this. So, before I lose time, you know, uh, before we go into NASCAR, which you spent a little time there, uh, let's wrap it up on the motorcycle side because there's so many sides to you. Uh, the when you were when you were so competitive and winning everything, was was there ever that rider that pushed your limits and you're like this son of a, and you you had to lay the wheel to him every once in a while? Was there, was there ever somebody that came after you on the track and even verbally off the track? And it, it, I don't want you to you know to not be mean, but who was that guy and did it ever happen? Yeah, never never verbally. Um, and luckily for me, Kenny, I got to race against the best in the business, uh, just from how I was born and, 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 the, and the time that I came up through uh, motocross and supercross race. And I got to race the king of, of supercross, Jeremy McGrath. Uh, he's got 72 wins. Wow. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's going to be tough for anybody to, to, to beat that. Um, Jeremy was one of the kindest racers. And what I mean by that is um, he'd race you hard, 
but you never had to look to your left, you know, in a left-hand corner or even right-hand corner. You never had to look over your shoulder because he wasn't going to, you know, he just wasn't that type of rider. Um, you know, James Stewart, I had great, great battles with him, especially when he, you know, he was later in his career and he had learned and he had had the bumps and bruises. Uh, he was a little more wild, but never really would attack you, but he'd race you hard and give you a little elbow grease. Uh, but the one guy I will say, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him, but um, I just, I, I, I could trust him in a way, but I knew he'd sweep the leg if he had an opportunity. And that would be uh, Chad Reed, the Aussie. Oh, I'll be done. Uh, but that guy, what, what, was so, <laughs> what was so hard about him is, you know, I talked about earlier when we were talking is, you know, how I would, I would be willing to hang it out. And he never would go out of his comfort zone. So, but his comfort zone was just fast enough to where if you wanted to beat him, you had to, you had to push that limit. So he was a, like a damn thorn in my side. He really was. Of all the people that I've raced him, uh, that I raced, I knew like McGrath, I could ride the edge and I was going to beat him. I knew like uh, Stewart, all I had to do was match his speed. And if I could just match him, I wasn't, I, yes, I wanted to beat him, but I'm like, if I can just follow him, pressure him, he's going to make a mistake and I'm going to win. Uh, it, it, it didn't always work out like that, but if I tried to go faster, he's just going to go faster. So that was kind of my strategy for James Stewart. But Chad Reed, I mean, he was just good. And I had to rely on a mistake from him because his comfort level was just enough to where I had to ride out of my comfort zone to beat him. And just he was so solid. You're like, oh, man, this is going to be a great night. He got a bad start and he'd be second or third by the end of the race. So but never off the track verbally or anything like that. But those three guys are the racers that kind of kind of come to my head. But those are the guys that I raced hard for, for championships for multiple, multiple years. Yeah, that's good stuff. And Charlie, clip that right there. That, that, that was a highlight. I, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us because, uh, you know, sometimes competitors, they got a, the hee-haw, they really don't know, but you said that so good. Just that guy that, you know, this, the story that I've been sharing lately mm -hmm. is that I read – uh, the great tennis player Bjorn Borg, he said, uh, yep. when, I, when I was playing tennis, I was bitter. And I got rid of all my Wimbledon trophies, got rid of everything. And then later on in life, yeah, came to peace at what he was doing, realized he was good. So he went and spent millions of dollars on his trophies. And, and get, getting them back. Getting them back. Uh, and, Dude. you know, oh. isn't that unbelievable? Oh, it's unbelievable. Like, now I gave away all my shit. Dude, I, I, I mean, I say all of it. I don't have my first motorcycle. I don't have my second motorcycle. I got three championship motorcycles here that Suzuki gave me two and Kawasaki gave me one. I don't have any other motorcycles. I gave away helmets, gear. I mean, I don't have anything. And now here I am, you know, 20 years post-retirement, post-racing for, for, for a living professionally. And I'm like, damn, I wish I would have kept majority of the stuff it would have been cool to reflect but you don't know that at the time and and to be honest i mean we had to sell a lot of our stuff to get yeah. another motorcycle to well, keep on going racing at the amateur stage so i didn't mean to interrupt you but no, I, no, no. I can resonate with what you're saying no no there's no interrupt to me you're you're first and no that's this is your show this is your show bro. Stop it. <laughs> kenny kenny conversations where kenny for once shuts <laughs> up and it I wonder where Schrader's at. He's like, oh, yeah. Schrader would say, oh, so you can shut up? <laughs> hey, let me go back to about 10 minutes ago. Uh, and I do want to talk about maybe, are you looking for any of your old stuff? But re remember that one. Yeah. Are you looking for any of your old stuff? But let's cover this one first. For all the kids out there that probably should have taken an economic class, uh, and I'm not prying because you're the one that brought it up. Go ahead. Uh, are you financially? Obviously, you look like you are. You look incredible. But you, you were able to make enough money mm -hmm. in, in such a short time span. You know, like mm -hmm. we talked about how early you have to quit. I follow your every move on Instagram. I mean, you're getting it on with Triumph. Uh, yeah. So yep. because of all your success, I don't even know how to ask it, but you know what I'm asking. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, so I I money, I, money I made right a now. great I made a great living for myself. 
I won a lot of championships. And I'll give you it. So my first year in 1997 was my first year professional. I signed a three-year deal with uh, Pro Circuit Kawasaki. And it was a, a 30000 the first year, 60000 the second year, and 90000 the third year. I got about halfway through my second season. And then we started renegotiating and I signed a contract. But um, so in, in, in my championship bonus, my first year in 1997, when I won the 125 Pro Motocross Championship, I got a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. And you get pro, you get, uh, you know, you get per race uh, win bonuses and all, all that fun stuff. But then, you know, later on in my career, Kenny, I was for Supercross Championship at the premier level. I was, you know, million dollar championships. Yeah. So definitely uh, it was a good ride. Um, I did I did really well for myself along the way. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I for, for my for my for me personally, I work because I love doing it. I love my uh, my role at NBC as an analyst. For uh, Super Motocross World Championship, you see you see us on there all the time, all the and time. Then, uh, yep, and That's then uh, my stuff with, uh, <laughs> that I do with Monster, that I do with Fox Racing, that uh, I do with Triumph now. That's the newest thing. I had uh, been with them for three years doing adventure riding, and we are about to launch um, in February. They should be on the showroom floors. I'm hoping sometime around there. Um, Triumph is going to have a motocross, supercross, bike, and enduro model as well. So I was a huge part of that, building that from the ground up with them, which was a really, really fun project for me. Um, so <clears throat> just to keep myself busy, man, uh, that, that's why I do it. I mean, obviously, yes, it's good uh, to, to still be earning a few dollars. Uh, you know, I don't, have to, I don't have to touch my principles or my investments or anything like that because of that. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'll be 44 in November and who knows, you know, my wife, my wife is a, a part owner in a lot, uh, a firm here in Tallahassee. So I'm just going to keep on rolling. That's why, but yes, uh, monetarily, I'm, I was very blessed and don't have to work if I don't want to. And I want the kids to hear that. Um, uh, I'm such a big fan of yours on Instagram that while my head was bopping and weaving, so here, here I am, and uh, so I'm going to go to this picture. I really want to talk about this Triumph bike because, you know, Rusty, my brother Rusty and Stephen, we, yeah. we know that those bikes are coming, Ricky, where you're on asphalt, going down the road, then you jump on the dirt. They are. Uh, this, this one here. Yep, that's Swing Arm City. Yep. Yes. So, um, and, and this is off the cuff. Yeah, go ahead. I was ahead. going where you were going. Tell me about Triumph and – and I see you doing a lot of riding with, yeah. with that bike. And where are we with motorcycles nowadays? Yeah. So the, the adventure world it was huge. And I feel like it really took off and escalated when uh, when, when COVID came around. People mm. wanted to be outside. So those adventure bikes, uh, the Tiger 900, and they got a Tiger 1200. Uh, I believe they have a 750 as well. Um, but uh, they, they, you can go on road. And off road, they're very versatile. Love it. Uh, the tigers it. are a little more geared towards towards the road and like touring bikes, but you they have off road capabilities like good good gravel roads, jeep trails. Got to be careful with the single track. You know, you got to be choosy on the single track. A super tight single track can be can be challenging. Uh, like we we climbed the Engineer Pass for anyone that's ever been to Colorado. Uh, we, we did go up over engineer pass just right outside of your on those, on those bikes. So they have the capabilities to do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's been a lot of fun. You can go out, you can make great memories, but that off-road riding or adventure riding is coming. That category has been absolutely massive, as you know, uh, with your brother and, and your nephew being in, on the road side of things, it's, you, you can't turn a blind eye to that adventure category because it is, it is growing. Absolutely. I mean, it's so fast, so fast. And it's a lot of fun. Like I said, you can go anywhere. And the great thing about it is like we, we do a, uh, we do a summer ride each year and <clears throat> you're not, you're not married to just one pass. You know, you can go, you can go off road. It's like, man, it'd be really cool to go over here. Boom. You hop on a, you hop on a dirt trail 
and you go. I mean, you guys go out to Sturgis every year. Imagine if you could hop on some dirt roads, nothing too gnarly, nothing too crazy, but still safe and fun. You have the ability to do that. And that's what I think people like about it. And I really do like when you get off your bike nowadays, uh, yeah. you give a nice little wrap up on Instagram. It's a good way to follow what you're up to. And uh, I think that's really what drew my attention to it. But being honest, you know, Rusty and Steven are building these Harley Davidson yeah. batters and we got the saying that, hey, listen, it ain't all about riding your girl on the back. Now they're racing baggers. And and then and then that's I cool, by the way. That is yeah, cool. And I and I took that and then I started seeing you, mm -hmm. you know, run that ride that triumph. And I said, Well, look at here, the the motorcycle world is is changing in every way. It's it's not you gotta have this bike and you gotta have that bike. Look at Ricky going down the highway and jumping on dirt. That's right. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, and the greatest thing, too, about it, Kenny, is, as you know, anytime you're on your motorcycles, you're making memories with some of your closest friends. And it's something that you can bring with you till the day you die. And it's where you go. It's the people you meet. And, uh, and, and But you still get that fix. You get that need. A little more different with the adventure stuff than, than the baggers, just because you're, you're on the road most of the time. But you know, you guys still have a great time, just like we do on the adventure bikes. We're able to go off road if, if, if we want to. And if we want to stay on road, we can. And it's about building memories and having a good time. And, and at the end of the day, being safe. I went on the Kyle Petty cherry ride this year. I saw that, dude, I got to do that, man. It looks, and, and he's asked me so many times and uh, I just need to, I just need to put it on the damn calendar. Is it, is it fun? I can't, do you got, you got straighter to do that? Oh, so listen, since since you like it, I'm, I'm going to tell you, and this is what made me think of it. You know, Kyle's been doing that a long time. And uh, he said to me very seriously, he goes, you know, I used to think this was about motorcycles. He says it's about people. Yeah. And, and, and so uh, he's been asking me for years. Mm -hmm. And I said, Kyle, I, I have something that that God gave me that that I don't deal with very good. I said. You put me on a motorcycle with a, with a, a, a closed face helmet, I'll go nuts. I'll be talking to myself. You know, <laughs> he goes, hold on. He says, the cow petty charity right now. <laughs> you know, you know, man, man I, I better have a microphone to talk to my buddy. We do. Hey, what are you doing there, buddy? <laughs> yeah, that's right. We got, so on our rides, we use, um, we use uh, communication, Cardo. They make a great. Uh, Got it. Yeah, they make great stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, it's always we're always busting chops on uh, on our buddies on the rides and stuff like that. And it is, it's about the people and and destinations that you go. We came across this place. You ever been to Darby, Montana? This where Yellowstone's filmed. Uh, probably close, but yeah, you so. all do. We stay at this killer little. Like they, they got these cabins on this little creek running through there. We get there early like and fish. have some adult beverages and enjoy ourselves. Oh, yeah. And we go into town and we eat, we eat some good dinner and go to the local bar there, shoot darts and all that fun stuff. But that's like a destination that we go to. And it's stuff. Had we never been on adventure bikes or been on a, a motorcycle, we'd never probably never had no reason to go there. But it's an awesome place. So it's a making memories. And then it's like you said, social media is everything. And you do a great job on social media. And I would say uh, the two wheel world has done a great job and not extreme sports, but, uh, you know, dirt bike riding and stuff. We're kind of on the forefront of social media. And it's, it's a way of business, but everyone's allowed to follow along. And, and even though you're not there in the flesh, hopefully you feel like you're a part of, we want people to feel like they're a part of the ride and the journey. Well, well, you're, you're really good at it because like I told you, I listen to your quick little videos when you get off the bike, but going back to Cal Petty, um, he's geared that deal more for the hyperactive world, you know, right. which it, that's where we're at now. Everybody's hyper. Nobody can wait for anything. So Kyle's got that deal where I think our longest ride would maybe be two and a half hours as to where back in the day, they really went across. Long the days, road. right. Yeah. And, you know, geared more to the older people, the hyper people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd be stretching it if we were on the bike three hours uh, because we stopped out in the middle of the desert and at a nice little gas station, you know, there's that one yeah. gas station in and we got a nice box lunch, but there is so much 
the Kyle Petty charity ride is it changed my life and Kim and myself are going to do it again. So yeah. Ricky, if you ever get a chance, it, it's, I'd fun. love to, it, it's fun. Well, okay. Look, I've done messed up. Uh, I've got you already at 50 minutes. So I, I got, mean, dude, you, I, I ain't got, I don't have anywhere to be. You know what? And, and you sound just like Tony Stewart. Tony's like, let's keep talking. Yeah. So let's let's go to this one sheet of notes I got here. You shocked the sports world when you came to NASCAR. Let's yeah, take a drink because we're gonna go to NASCAR now. So I'll just kind of let you have the lead here, and I'm gonna say this: Why NASCAR? How did that happen? Okay, so it was 2005, and I had already did my final deal um, with Suzuki. So I knew I was going to ride for Suzuki 2005, 6, and part-time in 07. Well, around 2005 or 6, Casey Kane uh, was a fan of Supercross, and he had reached out to me, him and his management group, and said, hey, man, would you ever like to uh, try four wheels? Casey King. Yeah. And I'm like, hell yeah. So we became buddies and, um, and, and one thing led to another. And this is like the, the short version just from a time perspective, but he gave me an opportunity and I, I, this is when he was driving for, uh, Everham and Everham had that, um, um, I don't even know what that program was at the time, but he had a late model program um coming up through there and i drove his late model car at uh, hickory <clears throat> never wow. been in a dang car before ever in my life but went Little up there track yep uh went there had a great time casey was uh kind of mentoring me one thing led to another uh and i guess gibbs got wind of it and then bobby ginn got wind of it also. And this is, um, so then next thing I know, fast forward, like, like I said, this is a short version. I'm like a ping pong ball all over the place. I am too. We're, so we're now all- like I'm getting towards 07 and then like, I'm talking to, 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 um, JD, I'm talking to coach. And at the time they're wanting to start motocross to supercross, you know? Oh, so yeah. like, I'll be just like, Hey, you know what? We'll give you an opportunity over here. Development program. Uh, we'll put you in here, but you're going to be behind these guys. Uh, but on the flip side, we want you to try to help us on our motorcycle deal. So I'm like, okay, man, sounds like a good deal. And then uh, Bobby Ginn and Jay Fry and all them were kind of courting me and saying, hey, we're going to have this race team over here and we're going to have Mark Martin driving for us. So um, the reason that I ended up at Bobby Ginn uh, was – being mentored by Mark Martin, I was going to be able to run his late model stuff uh, for the first year and a half, like 07, <clears throat> get get my feet wet and super late model stuff, and then move on to the to the East Series. And then that's where I ended up going and, and, and racing for Schrader. And uh, yeah, so I ended up signing with Bobby again because my manager at the time knew some people over there. And uh, so that's how I got into it, all because of Casey Kane. And... So let's see here. I had a, I signed a three-year deal with Bobby Ginn. We all know how that went. Let that, me start that on this, of... Ricky. One second here. Let me let me brag on you. Okay. Oh, go ahead. So you drove for Kenny Schrader, yep. Kevin Harvick, Turner Motorsports. That's it. Tur- awesome. Okay. You were the 2009 NASCAR Truck Series most popular driver. Yep. You ran. And this is just a reminder for all of our motorcycle fans out there. And and you had a lot of them stand on the front straightaway at Loudon and cheer you on. But that's right. I remember you came up to me. I had a that was when I was racing the East series for Schrader. Yeah. I thought we was gonna win that damn thing. Yeah, and, and, and I got something to say about that race, but let's finish this. Uh 68 truck races. It ain't like you came in and left. You that, that's a couple years. 68 truck races. Here's what I really like. This tells me how good you are. 18 top 10s. Um, eight races in almost the big boys. Eight races in the Xfinity Series. One top 10. That is extremely hard to do. And I want to say this about what we just talked about at Loudon. What really impressed me at Loudon was, at, like motorcycle racing, 
Ricky, I've raced my whole life and I know all the idiosyncrasies. At Loudoun, you were fighting for the lead. It's a flat track. It's a goofy ass track. You're running on the apron. You're straddling and you stayed with it and you did not, you did not spin out. You did not wreck. Um, I was really proud of you at that moment. Tell me what you remember about that great race for the win. Yeah, well, I remember. Um, so we went up there to test and this is, I came in at a difficult time in, uh, of NASCAR, as you remember, like that 07 time. That's when they stopped, couldn't test anymore. And so Stops now and I'm were leaving. Right. Like all this. And so I'm like, oh man. So now I'm coming in and in the truck series that time, I mean, it was stacked, right? It was sacked. And all, in all reality, I probably would have had better luck in the Xfinity series. I mean, dude, I'm racing against Hornaday, Skinner, Bodine, you name them, dude. They, they were there. Yeah. And uh, it was tough, but I learned a lot from them. And, um, but go back to Loudon. I remember we were trying to right front coil by him. Oh we, yeah. We couldn't yeah, get that's it right. That's tedious. That's very touchy. Yeah. And I didn't have enough experience at the time uh, to, uh, to, to, to tell them, man, this is where it really needs to be. But what I did know is every time we went back to the conventional setup, the thing would just, it would roll the center so good. And I wasn't blowing the right front up. Right. Yep. You're saying so that's, that's, what we, <clears throat> that's what we went with. And, um, I just, I just knew like, man, I could just carry my momentum through the center of the corner and it was relatively easy. So that's what we went with kind of old school conventional setup, not right front coil bind. And they did a great job with, with my setup. And I loved, I loved that racetrack and I did always run, ran well at Martinsville and anything with timing, like some mm -hmm. road courses always did well there just because I feel like with the timing and the braking and the getting off the gas and not having to re rely on aero uh, really helped me kind of fill the gap of my lack of experience because of the timing. And it brought me back to supercross and yeah, it, motorcycle racing. So yeah. that's what I remember of that race. I'm like, Oh, we're going to, we have a good chance to win. Obviously we didn't, but hell, I think we got like third or fourth. It was or a hell of a race. Hell yeah, of a race. It was, it was great. It was great. I remember you came up there. Montoya came up there. Of course, Schrader came up there. But I, I, I tell you what, that was some of the funnest racing that I ever did when I got to 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 drive for uh, for Schrader. So the um, for the fans that are like, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, <laughs> coil coil binding makes the front end run lower down yeah. the straightaway. Can create speed. Can can you can gain a 10th or two coil binding because the front end is now very low and yeah, conventional setup. The front end is going to be a little higher, but you got a little more consistency. It's always on the right front. And that's what you liked about that. And I just went through this Dale Earnhardt Jr. Oh, yeah. Had is that when you did that? Car. Yeah. I went and run the cars tour race yeah. just two weeks ago. And I went through the exact same thing. All the young kids are running this, you know, on the bump stops and, and, and they, they put in the old man setup for me. And I said, Oh, that's way better. <laughs> yeah, right? Totally. Don't I will tell you one, one time, uh, we went, this is when I, I think I went there in Kevin's car. He sent me to, uh, Kentucky one time. They had a, uh, they had a test and I went there in an Arca car, dude. And we tried a left front coil bind. Yeah. And I loved that. Oh. I mean, I felt like I, I mean, I just felt I had really good feel for the left front and I loved, I, I absolutely loved, loved that. Never ended up racing with it. I don't believe, but uh, man, I love when we tested it. It was awesome. Like, holy crap, man. If I could run this, this would be, this would be great. We uh, we're going through an era right now where, uh, you know, this new next gen car is yeah. the same. And now, now we've got drivers that have never won uh, coming to the top and winning. Yeah. And my brother, Russ, you know, Michael McDowell, you've got yeah. Ross Chastain. These guys are winning because all the cars are equal. So some drivers that you thought that were never that great, but Ricky, you just, you just touched on something. When you were in NASCAR, it was about the race car. Now, Kevin Harvick was always great. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Kevin Harvick is great, but, what made good drivers even great was what you just said. Those great teams back then, 
they could get an advantage and become unbeatable. Right. Uh, so, yes, that left front coil binding, uh, Kevin's team, uh, they were on it. Yeah. And uh, that's cool. You got to experience that. Yeah. I mean, my learning, my learning curve was so steep. Um, I'm, there's some things that I was proud of uh, going back to the truck series. Um, I mean, I had a great time in the E series. I sat on the pole at uh, at one of the races, <clears throat> had some good That's finishes, great. and yeah, and and it was it, dude, that it was stacked back then. It was uh, you know that's when DEI had their uh, development program. I'm racing against Austin Dillon, Trevor Bain. I mean, I mean, you, you know how fast those people are. Trevor Trevor and Bain they, won the day I mean, five hundred. Yeah, look at look at look at them today. Yeah, two Daytona 500 champions. Yeah. So it was cool. I got I got to race against a lot of good guys. I had an absolutely great time. Then we go to the truck series, and I I think I won the pole in Atlanta one time and ran led some. That takes Atlanta. balls. That tracks. Yeah. You're running 200 mile an hour around there. I loved Atlanta. You know, this was before the repay. But the reason that I liked it is because you could adjust to the truck when the tires were going off, you could, you know, you could, you, yeah, you adapted to the, to the tires as they started to fall off. And I loved, I absolutely love that rate, that, that racetrack. I love Texas always did well at Texas. Um, and then, the, you know, the smaller tracks were always easy for easier for me, just because like we already talked about the timing and, and, and less, less reliant on arrow. The arrow for me was the biggest learning curve um, I, I wish I could have learned how arrow works a little bit quicker. I think my results would have been a little bit better, but, uh, Hey, you know what? I was still thankful for the opportunity and about the time I got the, uh, arrow figured out and, and, and how to use it towards my advantage. Uh, yeah, the, my, my NASCAR ride was over. So kind of closing this NASCAR thing out, we look at, we look at Travis Pastrana who came. Uh, yep. Ricky Johnson came yep. and raced with me in the Red Dog truck. Yeah. Uh, not comparing you all to each other, but you definitely had the most success out of those three. Uh, money, was money just too catastrophic? Was it just so unbelievable to, to stay going? No, what happened was, and, and this is a great question. So everyone wants to know, man, what happened? So everything was going great. And um, uh, Monster was going to leave Turner, and, and they went to KBM. Everybody knows all that, and uh, they liked Kyle, and uh, Kyle, they, they wanted to go from the Truck Series to the Nationwide Series. And so this is how the story went. Um, they were going to take their, their sponsorship to, uh, to KBM, and as they did that, I was going to drive part-time. Uh, and now remember KBM was just starting their nationwide program and we had gotten oh, everything. Sports. Remember that? Oh, yeah. And I was going to drive like 18 races, uh, in 2012, I think it was, or maybe 13, 12 or 13. And, uh, Kyle was, Kyle was going to do the other ones and to be like, it was going to be great. Kyle was going to mentor me and I was going to learn, and so, uh, you know, and he was going to, I was going to cut my teeth with him in the nationwide, which is now it's Xfinity. So we're about ready to go. This was Texas. Okay. And I'll never forget this. We were sitting at, I was sitting at a Starbucks in my rental car, myself and my manager. And we were talking to Rick Wren, who was running the joint at the time. Yeah. And um, we were like, okay, got all the, got all the specifics done. We'll fly up to Nash or Charlotte. <laughs> like like that Monday or Tuesday after Texas. Well, everyone knows what happened at Texas uh, with, with, with Kyle and, and, and Horn. Yep. So then things got on the rocks, right? The next two weeks. Well, got it, got them back on the tracks um, after Phoenix. And, you know, we, we, we go into Homestead, everything's good. Same type situation. Hey, um, everything's good. We're back on track. Eminem's still going to sponsor me in the cup. Monsters, we're ready to rip. Okay. I'm like, all right, I'm going to fly up. We've got the truck uh, banquet on Sunday or Monday in Miami. I'll fly up on Wednesday. Well, Kurt had some issues on Sunday at Homestead and then got let go by Penske, right? 
I think that if my memory serves me right. And then that was around Tuesday. I, did he get let go pretty quick, didn't he? Mm. He, there, there was, a, I know a lot. And let's just say there was a lot of drama there. <laughs> yeah, lot unfortunately, he wasn't going to be yeah. driving for, for Penske the next year. And as soon as that happened, they're like, hey, don't come up Wednesday. And as soon as as soon as I didn't go up there on that Wednesday, and I, maybe I'm a little confused on the specific days, but all I knew is when Kurt <clears throat> wouldn't be riding for driving for uh, Penske the following year, I'm like, well, I know what I know what this means. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, yeah, the, the next thing you you know is uh, he's he's driving for his brother, which I have I, I'm not bummed at that. I'm not upset at that. Would I love the opportunity? Of course I, I would have. But I'm also, you know, I'm smart. I try to be smart about business and I can't blame Monster. I can't blame Kyle for uh, hiring his brother. I mean, blood is thicker than water and straight up facts. I mean, Kurt could run circles around me. So you want, I mean, Monster wants to win. Kyle certainly does. Kurt does. You have to hire Kurt over me, dude. I mean, come on. So um, I was I was just thankful to even be uh, in the conversation. But uh, yeah, they went with uh, Kurt, which I would have done um, every single day of the week and twice on Sunday. So uh, like I said, I'm not I'm not bummed about it. And uh, they made the right the right the right decision. So that's how my NASCAR deal ended. Well, you know what? Uh, we, we've all seen the movie. Uh, there's a lot of ups and downs. And yeah, hell, I uh. I never really even knew what happened. But thanks for telling us that, Ricky. Yeah. I appreciate it because, I mean, it always comes down, you know, when I talk, well, obviously I had to get all my own sponsors. And, you know, in, in the Xfinity series, it was always $6 million a year. Yeah. A cup was always, you know, if you were Jimmy Johnson and Rick Hendrick, it was $20 million a year. And it was, it's not easy. Uh but man, you, you you kick some butt, and uh, let's thank you. You you you, um, you know I, I kind of, I mean I, I always give my opinion, and that's what I'm known for. I, I think NASCAR was very unlucky right there because the eyeballs you were bringing a load of of your people eyeballs with you, and we we talked about that. We we remember all the uh, motocross fans lining the fences and cheering you on. So. Uh, no drama. So, uh, well, it's all good. Hey, and I, I, I want to say too, like and a lot of people do, I, I had a great, what I loved about NASCAR racing and listen, every sport has their problems. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But like it ain't peaches and cream anywhere as, as you know, Wallace, but it's, it's, it's just like, it, you know, like I'm, I'm happy for the opportunity. I was always, there's so many great drivers that were willing to help me. Guys that I were race that I was racing against. I mean, that we just don't you. happen. And, we admire and you. We don't. Yeah, we that just don't happen in Supercross and Motocross. So that's that's what I loved about it. I loved the fans. They were super yeah. super gracious. And um, yeah, I mean, I I love it. I mean, NASCAR is a love of mine, and uh, it gave it was a great opportunity. I've I've picked up some great friends along the way. Yeah, like me. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I love it. I can't wait. I can't, you know what I love about, um, you know, love listening to you when you were on, uh, on Fox sports. And, uh, now that you're not on the TV gig anymore and you're doing your own thing, it's, it's been a lot of fun. You can speak freely and, and, and you, you bring, you, you bring the real stuff to the table. I am, uh, I'm 60 years old now. I'm, I'm retired. Good for uh, you. I, I run the hell out of my dirt car. I stay young. I eat grilled chicken. I, I have me and Mark Martin talked about good omega fat, some salmon. Uh, I'm doing my very best, buddy. I want, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you and hey, I want, I want no, I see, I, I look at you, want to be like you, man. I'm but, now, <laughs> I, hey, I'm telling you, I want to, I want to be like you, but hey, I will say about racing dirt, some of the funnest times I've ever had in four wheels was doing the prelude to the dream, bro. Incredible. That right? was, I mean, it's just like this, a grin driving the whole time. And that's my claim to fame. I think I uh, maybe want, I got set second to Ambrose in my heat race 
at the, at the prelude. And then uh, I think I got sixth in the feature, but I got a, I got a picture. I was leading all the boys there uh, early on in the feature. Or it might have been might have been the heat, but man, that was a fun event. Have have you have you seen how dirt super late models have changed the racing world? They're paying one million dollars to win. Davenport has won that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, O'Neill Hudson O'Neill, which is uh, uh, you know the, the, we call him the New Deal. His father retired, but he makes a last corner pass on Sunday night. Last corner. I didn't see it. No. Wins the Lucas Oil Championship and wins a hundred thousand dollars. These guys, with 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 the flow of stream, you know, with, with flow, yep. flow yep. vision, flow dirt vision, stream. They're, they're paying. I mean, every single race is paying twenty thousand to win, a hundred thousand to win. Are you paying attention to all that? Yeah, yeah, it's massive. The streaming. I mean, you know, we stream all of our stuff on Peacock. And um, you even got it. I got got a podcast, Title Twenty Four. It's on Peacock. Check it out. Uh, that, but that it's right. That was yeah. right there. In my there notes. you go. There you podcast, go. Baby, right there. <laughs> there Presented by NBC Sports. They uh, they were very thankful for them. But yeah, the streaming is, is huge, and I think it's done a lot for for like you guys that are in super remote areas, uh, giving the respect that it's due, like them dirt cars, you guys racing out in the middle of dang nowhere. And same for like, and same for the motocross season. I mean, we're not in massive metropolitan areas. So the streaming, um, packages have really done a lot of good for, for some of these race series. I'm, I'm happy for all of the drivers, athletes and sponsors, everything. It's, it's perfect. Ricky, you have officially became either the leader or second only to Tony Stewart. We are at an hour and seven minutes. Listen, you have been absolutely incredible. I, I got to be honest. I've lost sleep the last two nights. I started last week when I called you. Yeah. Because uh, I didn't want to mess this up. And I, uh, you, you did I've had a you. wonderful time. Oh, I did too. I, like I said, I'm, I'm happy for you, man. I just love how happy you are. Thank you for, uh, for having me on. Um, anytime I can talk to the four wheel world. Um, uh, I really did. You guys were always so gracious to me. Your, your fans, my fans in the four wheel side. Um, I love it. I, I, I truly do. And, um, appreciate, appreciate you having me on. And anytime you need anything from me in my world, I'm glad to have you. Man, that makes me happy. It really does to have a friend like you. Well, listen up, everybody. We are in podcast form. The Kenny Wallace Show is showing up on podcasts. We are in iTunes, Spotify. Check us out. Ricky, until next time, buddy. Thank you so much. And goodbye, everybody. That's right.